Starting your first renovation project is such a thrilling prospect. It's your chance to create the home of your dreams, make it totally customised to your needs so that you can introduce some serious life enhancements. But let's face it, it can also be a major source of stress and anxiety. As a new renovator, you may be facing numerous fears and blockers, such as not knowing where to start, whether it's going to break the bank, and what actual order to do the work in. And the chances of making costly mistakes are high, which only adds to your stress levels. But don't worry, you're not alone, because at Fifi McGee, we understand the challenges that come with renovating a home, and we've been in your shoes more than once, and we're here to help. I'm going to share with you the five crucial stages of a typical renovation, and it's going to increase your confidence and knowledge and crucially help you avoid making any rookie mistakes or having to redo work. I'm also going to be mentioning our online course and a free resource that you can try if you're in need of extra renovation support. So let's get started. Stage one, number crunch like your life depends on it. I hate to tell you this, but the first stage of your renovation isn't a very sexy one. You'll likely want to launch full steam ahead to decide on knocking down walls here and extending there, but the smarter thing to do first is to get very clear on your numbers, and I mean very clear. Your budget is the foundation that your renovation is built on, so my first tip is prepare to get very friendly with a spreadsheet. Having a process and a system for how to budget is going to really help you understand what's realistic and give you that sense of peace of mind that you won't run out of cash or have to live in an unfinished property for the rest of your life. According to a study done by Hiscox, 40% of renovators will overshoot their budget by an average of 20%. And when we're talking about such big sums that you're investing into a property, that is a hefty chunk. If you need some direction with forecasting your costs, I've actually recorded a free class explaining exactly how to ballpark your renovation costs and some cheeky insider trade secrets on how to reduce your costs and prevent them spiralling. You can get access to that in the description box below. During your number crunching though, we always advise renovators to prioritise remedial works flagged in your surveys first. It's just going to really help you sleep better at night knowing that the property is safe, secure and watertight and obviously it's a sensible start to any renovation work when you know that all the problems are fixed. But of course, even with the best planning and best budgeting in the world, things will come up for you that you just can't budget for now. And that's why it's essential to set up a healthy contingency fund. We always recommend a rainy day pot of 10 to 20% of your total budget. And really the more the better to help you with those pesky unforeseen costs. As soon as you have a clear idea of your budget, you can start to figure out how you can actually save some money. And like any project, there are places where you can spend less and also places where you need to get the right option in and I'm sharing some smart ways to do this in my free renovation class that I mentioned earlier. So click the card on screen now or check the link in the description box. Okay, so your budget's in place. You're chomping at the bit to start choosing colours and furniture and make this rundown property your dream family home. But before you do that, you need to master your layout. And stage two is planning your layouts. I have to say that this is where I personally thrive when it comes to renovation planning. Neil always handles our budgets and I lead on the layouts and design. And I have to say that figuring out a vision for your home as early as possible is one of the most important steps of renovating. You need to get clarity early on about what you want the look and feel of every single room to be like and also how you're going to reshape those spaces. This helps you optimise for things like light, storage, and it makes the space feel as livable and beautiful as possible. And it makes sure that you're just getting the most out of your budget. Now, if this doesn't come naturally to you, or if you have a particularly odd shaped home that's really difficult to work with, um, or if you've got a really tight budget, then don't worry because there's always a way our renovation course students, often they end up feeling really relieved to reveal undiscovered potential that they had in their spaces. So for more information on the exercises we share and how to access that course, I've popped a link in the description box below. And maybe you can see in your mind's eye how you want your renovation to look, or maybe not. But what's really important is that you start to get your ideas for layouts on paper and really don't worry about whether your drawing is next level art or not. In fact, I always encourage people to be scrappy. It's all about exhausting your layout options and just really considering all of your options. When you've got that in hand, it's time to do a measure up of your whole home, and this is known in our industry as a measured survey. This doesn't have to be overcomplicated, there are plenty of tutorials online that you can follow. 
And a little tip that I have, if you can't measure the thickness of the walls, or if you want to add walls to your drawings, is to allow around 110 millimeters to account for the wall structure and plasterboard. Exterior walls, on the other hand, are a little bit trickier as they vary by house and construction style, but I tend to allow 300 millimeters for exterior block work. Next, you can get really creative by trying out some 3D visualisation. There are quite a few design rules to consider here and it's important that you start your learning as soon as possible. But there are loads of tools online to help you formalise your plans and some I'd recommend are things like Floor Planner, Magic Plan, DIY Kitchen's 3D planning tool and various others. Now, whenever planning is mentioned, people assume that they need an architect. Starting out with one can seem like the obvious thing to do because you're renovating a house, right? But there is so much thinking to be done first. You really need to firm up ideas on your space and how you want to live in it before you speak to an architect. And unfortunately, we learned this the hard way. During our renovation back in 2016, we spent thousands on an architect, only to realise too late that we had hired them way too early. So because some projects do actually need one and some definitely don't, I've made a video on approximate costs and to help you answer that question about whether you need an architect or not. It could literally save you thousands, so definitely watch this video. I've popped it on screen and I'll also link it in the description. The next stage is to hire an architect and lock in your plans. So once you've figured out in your own mind how you want the house to look, now might be the time to bring in professional guidance and get your ideas all put on paper and put them into action. Though there are thousands out there, finding a decent architect is like looking for a needle in a haystack. And my tip is to find architects who really design the sorts of properties that you're aspiring to create. This is why my last point about defining your vision is so important. It means that you're working towards something clear and other people that you're bringing on board are really clear about what you're working towards. The likelihood of your architect delivering designs within your taste and budget then becomes so much higher because they specialise in your type of home and look. Really get clear on what level of project you're aspiring to. So for example, many home extenders will be quite happy with an average budget kind of standard extension that complements their house type rather than that architectural masterpiece that requires a high level of specialist architecture. You know, you wouldn't expect a Michelin star chef to serve you bubble and squeak, nor would you want to pay them to cook it for you. Instagram is actually a great shop window to look for architects and it can really give you an idea about the type of projects that they try to win. Another piece of advice is to get clarity on your interior design layout at this stage, which is going to give you certainty that there's space for everything that you want before you submit any planning applications. And what it also means is if you spot any tricky design situations, you'll be able to correct them before they actually arise in real life. Finding out that you can't fit that kitchen island you've been dreaming about can be really upsetting at first, but at least you know what your limitations are and you can work with them. And good planning means that if you do need to change course, you won't be breaking your budget or compromising on the overall design either. It's so much better to figure everything out at this stage rather than going full steam ahead with the renovation and realising when work is underway that you've, you know, got builders looking at you crazy like, that's not going to fit. No one wants that. Which brings me on to the next stage, working with contractors. Don't get me wrong, working with contractors can be a lot of fun, but it's not always easy and some play hard to get and won't even return your calls. My tip here is to get them excited about your project. They want to work with clients who are happy, who communicate well and just know what they want for their renovation, not the sort that is going to change their minds five times at the last minute. So if a job really sounds up their street and it's really well organised, they're going to be much more likely to get involved. What's important when working with contractors is that you ensure that your communication is top notch. And phone calls are almost always the preferred method of comms for these guys. They'll likely be using a sledgehammer and covered in dust when you get in touch, which doesn't bode well for typing email replies. So make a list of the questions that you need to ask them, fire them off on the phone, and you can always follow up on email later. Another great thing about phone calls is that they really help you to build and keep that rapport. Remember, these guys may well end up being in your house a lot and you want to get all the signals as early on as possible about whether they're the right people that you want to work with. Also keep in mind that depending on the scope of your renovation, you might need to think about putting contracts in place. This is the time to do it. If something does go awry when work starts happening, at least you know who is liable. There's a lot to consider from a legal standpoint, including JCT contracts, insurance, third party wall agreements. 
that's if it's applicable to you. If protecting yourself legally is something that kind of puts the fear of God in you, then don't worry because we break it all down step by step in our renovation course, plus there's loads of really supportive threads in our Reno Club community to find out how other renovators are doing it. And the next stage is let the renovation work commence. Welcome to the really exciting part. You've got your start date confirmed, you've bought a truckload of tea and biscuits, and you are officially ready to start renovating. And this is where all of that planning comes to fruition. You'll be so relieved that you put all of that great work in before because good planning early on removes so much stress in this crucial stage. So by this stage, you'll have agreed all of the roles and responsibilities. And this can depend on the route to build that you've actually chosen. So in a self-managed renovation, for example, what we found during ours is that if you're not careful, there can be some gray areas about whose responsibility is what. So for example, purchasing certain types of supplies, it usually depends on how particular you are. And me and Neil are really picky, so it falls on us to source many of the supplies. If left to the builder, unless you're lucky, you might end up with some sort of vanilla solution or one that doesn't complement your desired look, so we always like to take that on. However, you can often get a discount with your builder too, so check if they have a trade account whenever you buy something, especially if it's a high priced item from a large company. On the other hand, when using a design and build firm to manage the project, they would definitely be on point for the supplies and that in part is what you're paying them to do, to reduce the supply management headache. Don't underestimate how much work it takes, this is such an advantage of going the design and build route. And when the build starts, you will find the pace can be quite overwhelming and taxing. And what we've observed ourselves is that even the students who have been so good at preparing and have all of their ducks in a row, they still have a lot of small decisions to make when the build is in progress. Things like how high do you want these tiles, how close to the worktop do you want your plug sockets, or whereabouts should we position these down lights, you'll get all the questions. And this is where our Home Design Lab course actually gives you a very methodical decision making process. You can use it to optimise your design and detail all of your decisions up front so that you're not caught off guard at the last minute or making decisions on the fly. The key at this stage is creating a very effective framework for communication, making sure that you have weekly or even daily check-ins with your team to ensure that everyone is still on target, people are motivated and there's no blockers or um, anything preventing work like running low on supplies for example. Holding space for your team in this way will ensure that your expectations continue to be met and no big surprises come your way. Despite all of the upfront planning you do, it's natural that the process can slow down at times. Whenever that happens, just make sure that there are always things that you can keep busy with. Running projects for clients, we find that sourcing products takes up so much time and often you can't buy items straight away anyway, especially if you can't store them anywhere that's dry and damp proof. So use any slower periods in the renovation to order samples and find companies that you want to work with, have calls with them and just explore their products. Now in terms of the step by step to the construction, how long have you got? It varies massively depending on the scope of your project. But luckily we provide a full checklist of what to expect for new joiners who join our course. Neil and I would love to help you with your renovation project. So if you do need that extra support, head to the description box now and find all the links to the resources that I've mentioned in today's video. And if you're getting ready to renovate, then I would love to hear from you. Drop me a comment and tell me about your new place. Thanks so much for watching. And if you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the Fifi McGee channel for more renovation advice. See you in the next one.